Greetings, everyone. My name is Jean-Paul Rodrigue. I'm a professor at the Department of Global Studies and Geography at Hofstra University in New York. Um, the, I would like to thank uh, NextRise 2020 for giving me this opportunity to give, uh, can I say that, present to you my perspective about how globalization is going to be impacted uh, by the current pandemic, which is obviously unfolding. Um, this uh, presentation will last roughly, I would say, about uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, my contact information and additional information is available, as you can see on this slide. So uh, let's begin. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, is divide this uh, presentation, in, you could say, in three major stages. That is, first of all, a brief discussion about how transportation is a factor in, of diffusion of pandemics, particularly obviously in, in recent decades uh, with the growth of uh, the fast growth of international air travel. So that's pretty well known. Uh, however, what is uh, much less known and subject to a lot of speculation um, is basically what happens when a pandemic hits in a modern society, we could not evaluate that until recently. We simply at this point have just, I would say, uh, so relatively superficial information about that. But obviously this has impacted the supply chain, which was uh, struggling to continue, to offer continuity in freight distribution, at, at least supplying, uh, particularly, the, let's say, the food sector, uh, the pharmaceutical sectors, uh, for instance. So I'm going to talk about uh, back uh, propagation and back propagation mechanism, which are common in supply chain and how a pandemic has impacted that. And last and not least, <coughs> excuse me, we are going to discuss uh, the impact uh, of the pandemic on, on the future of the global economy. And that's uh, quite speculative, that, that's for sure. Okay, so let's move ahead. Um, so let's start about uh, how modern transportation systems have been particularly, I would say, effective at uh, helping the diffusion of, of a pandemic. This is pretty, particularly well known. And you can see on this slide here, um, some factors. I'm gonna, I, again, I'm gonna, not going to spend too much time talking about this behind what spread, spread diseases these days. Uh, we can think about, of course, in this case, uh, it's global air travel, which has been the major culprit the fact that we have a growing air connectivity around the world has certainly allowed, uh, I would say, a massive, fast distribution or propagation of a disease. So that's uh, one aspect. But there are others. Uh, also, you have a global trade for specific uh, type of diseases, particularly pests, uh, allows some form of, of diffusion. And other factors which are also pretty well known concerning poverty, and uh, wars, conflicts. Sometimes it's also linked with migration. A, a group of migrants can, can have a, a disease which has been endemic within, within their population. And then when they move to other location that could help spread a disease. Last as well, also we can think about medical practices. We use the term pathogenic natural selection, that is when using antibiotics over a long period of time, many diseases are developing an immunity to that. But obviously, uh, as far as we're currently involved with uh, the, the COVID pandemic, we talk about global air travel. And uh, again, that, that chart is pretty interesting. It tells you the wave of diffusion of the pandemic, uh, and which I would say can be divided in uh, four major phases at this point. I expect another wave maybe over the next coming month or so. But uh, here, if we, have, we can talk about the four major wave and how this had an impact, it's, I would say, quite interesting. Uh, as we are well aware, the first wave was the China wave. That is, it is where the pandemic started up. And it, we start to get report of this in uh, mid-January or so. It, it was obviously a complicated situation. You had all sorts of stories, denials, uh, counter-information. And that was it. In a sense, China went into a massive log, lo lockdown. It had a very big impact on global manufacturing, global supply chain, some uh, shortages. And then it started to recede. And then we entered a very 
I would say, on new, on real situation, which was called a stealth phase. Uh, during that time, um, we were not we were not realizing at this point that the, the, the pandemic was diffusing. Of course, in the case of Korea, uh, we started to have a few, uh, quite a few cases. Uh, Korea was on, on the news regarding this, but we started have also cases in cruise ships. But unknown to us at this point in time, we were not aware, much aware that the pandemic was diffusing within other population in Europe and North America. And then when uh, some form of critical mass was reached, the second wave hit us. And this is where you start to have the lockdown of the world's largest economy within the European Union, in, in the United States, Canada, Australia, name it, major economies start to implement lockdown procedures, which had a dramatic impact on consumption. And that created an immediate, almost a recession, a spike in unemployment, um, a, a massive decline of, of economic activity, it, essentially the disappearance of, of the tourism, of uh, discretionary spending. All of this was quite substantial. And after uh, a few weeks or so, we entered a third wave where this pandemic was receding uh, gradually in North America as well as Europe. And people thought, okay, good, it's under control. Uh, we're going to start to open up the economy again. And that's essentially what's happening. But uh, again, we have to bear in mind that also at this point in time, the pandemic start to also hit massively developing economies. And look at the, uh, the case of Brazil, which has now exceeded uh, the United States in terms of the, uh, the number of reported daily cases. Also, we can think about Russia, which appears under control. So that's the third wave. If we can think about a fourth wave, what's going to happen is, uh, it may have already began a little bit, is you could see a surge in new cases as economies are opening up and then you're going to see a new a new, a new wave of infection, probably much less than the previous one. But again, that's an interesting sequential process. And each of these phases had a substantial impact on the supply and demand. It happened in China, so that means the supply of manufacturing was deeply impacted first, and then it hit the global demand in Europe and North America. So that's a little bit the story here. And when we talk about the COVID pandemic, we cannot avoid talking about China. And I call that uh, the curse of connectivity. Uh, because China at this point in time, over the last few years or so, became massively uh, mobile, massively connected internally within China itself, which is a, a domestic air travel system, which is a high-speed rail system, which have a massive amount of trips. It also corresponded to the Chinese New Year's, which was a, a time of the year where a lot of Chinese were moving to visit their families. And also that the fact that China became the largest cruise market in the world. And that's why we got the, the initially in the, in the stealth, you can call it the stealth phase of the pandemic, uh, a large uh, number of cases in cruise ships. It was linked to some extent with the fact that uh, many Chinese are now, uh, uh, I would say, using this form of, of recreation. And also the fact that the cities, such as, for instance, such as Wuhan, were connected directly with a lot of foreign destinations. Uh, there were, I saw some estimates, for instance, that almost a three quarter of a million of people entered the United States from China just between December uh, 2019 and February 2020. So just to give you an example of how uh, connectivity in this case is of course a positive aspect. It allows uh, interaction, it allows trade, it allows a uh, uh, you could say business transaction tourism, all of this is great, but obviously as far as pandemics are concerned, this is also a double edge uh, sword. And uh, the case of China has quite obviously underlined that connectivity can be a curse. So let's talk about now uh, <clears throat> a little bit more in detail uh, what happened uh, when the pandemic hit over mobility and logistics and international trade. I'm going to focus a little bit about the United States because that's something I've been observing, of course, uh, uh, firsthand. Um, so essentially, we got uh, two back-to-back -back supply chain shock. The first uh, shock was the supply itself. It was linked, as I mentioned before, with the lockdown in China roughly between January and March. And we start to experience uh, key uh, shortages in pharmaceutical goods, medical equipment, also electronics, and so on and so forth. So it was a first shock. And then a few weeks later on, the second shock hit, which was a demand shock, which was in a sense back propagating within the supply chain. You saw a decline in the derived demand. People start to hoard a little bit. 
uh, not that much, but uh, I'll discuss that a little bit later on. You sort of have a massive lockdown and a lot of all the demands that we took for granted in terms of retail, in terms of, uh, for instance, restaurant, essentially vanish. And a lot of supply chains in retail and especially uh, e-commerce were put under a lot of pressure. And this phase essentially ended up uh, by the mid end of May in, in, uh, in let's say North America and, and Europe. So that those are the word of two shock. And I give you here a nice little example of how this took place. And that's what's very unusual because when you have a form of ordering, that is people are concerned about something, it's essentially a transferring of inventory uh, from uh, whatever the, the, the inventory is, most of the time in stores or distribution centers, to the homes of, of the consumer, because consumers, are, when they order, they are concerned that the goods will not be available in the future. And that's very common in the United States, where we have uh, natural disasters. We have, for instance, uh, hurricanes. It creates a uh, regional uh, uh, hoarding processes. But the good news we have when this happens is we have the capability to redistribute nationally. But here's a problem what happened with the pandemic, is it was the whole system at once that took place. In the United States, everybody, everywhere at the same time started to be concerned. And in that case, a lot of inventory of essential goods, and that's an example of a, a photo of, a, of, a, of the section in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in that case, a pharmacy in a drugstore, local drugstore, which offer paper goods, which was our towels, the toilet paper, for instance, all of this vanish overnight very rapidly, even if all the supply chain remained intact. That was, uh, I would say, interesting. And people start to wonder what, what was happening. Why goods are disappearing while the supply chains are intact? That is, uh, there were uh, paper companies, um, um, let's say food producers that produce the same amount of things. The demand remained relatively similar and the goods vanished. You say, what's happening? Why we see uh, shortages while the, the supply is plentiful? And that's, that's the point behind this is pretty clear is we have essentially two separate supply chains that cater to one, the commercial aspect, institutions, restaurants, and another supply chain that caters to consumers. And they're different. They don't have the same uh, I would say packaging. They don't service the same customers. So while the commercial demand vanish for toilet paper, for instance, um, because let's say airports were closed, uh, large institutions, universities, uh, schools, uh, shopping malls, restaurants, all of this shut down. So people start stop consuming commercial goods that were available in institution and switch to those available to regular consumer goods. And that created shortages because they could not be easily, and if at all, substituted. So that's an example of a form of a, of a demand shock that was really interesting to observe and created a lot of, I would say, of concern because of the inability of supply chain to, I would say, substitute between different economic sectors. That's an interesting, you could say, lesson for the future regarding this. And then we are now in the midst of it, it's the third shock, which I call the deferred demand shock. Uh, by this, I mean uh, that overall, of course, we have a decline in economic activity. People have been out of work uh, at home for a long period of time. They run out of savings. They run out, I would say, um, of their cash reserve, essentially. And the more the lockdown endures, the less you have demand in the future. And that's also something you have to think about the future of globalization. That the longer long lockdowns are taking place, uh, the less that that demand is defer deferred. That is, people assume, oh, if I stop consuming now, and I, I, instead of buying that car this month, I'm gonna buy that car or that refrigerator the next month, because right now I'm concerned. Uh, next month, what happens is you won't buy that vehicle because maybe you have uh, run out of cash, uh, you lost your job, and all the, the consumption, the, the V-shaped recovery that we thought would happen will likely not take place as this deferred demand is pushed further and further into the future. And that's a very big risk because it's also linked 
with risk of bankruptcies and uh, default uh, for, major, uh, let's say, for retailers. Uh, if, you know, for instance, stores have been closed down, the demand has dropped, they're not able to pay their rent, same thing for restaurants, same thing also for major uh, owners of real estate portfolios where their major customers, they're, they're, the, the people that, that rent for them, either commercial renting market or uh, I would say, of course, residential renting, all of this affecting uh, individual persons who don't own have a house and have a, a tenant all the way to a large, uh, you could say, holding company that owns several apartment buildings. They're pretty much all the same in, this, in, in a similar situation where the deferred demand in this case hit them because people, people stop paying their rent and, they, and, and it triggers some form of domino effect. And that's a very, very big risk. This is likely what's going to harm the most uh, the future global economic prospect because it creates very large def deflation, bankruptcy, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so moving on. Uh, this uh, figure uh, simply uh, shows you uh, uh, that representation within a supply chain and things uh, that is the, the defect of propagation. We have a supply shock where you have a demand shock. All of this is, of course, interrelated. So what I've discussed uh, previously is a represent on these figures um, as, as well in terms of the last mile deliveries. That is, um, we have observed during the pandemic a very sharp rise in uh, home deliveries for e-commerce. That's a net benefit in some ways. But this system was put under a lot of stress. Uh, that is for sure. But all of this is part of a, of a synchronization process. Uh, if you can look at this from a, a supply chain perspective. So conventionally, each time you have a recession, this is how it articulates itself uh, in terms of its impact on the global economy. Uh, we can think upon, upon the, the demand factor. That is, depending upon the severity of the recession, uh, usually it is not luxury or basic goods that, that, that's a, a decline of the demand, particularly basic goods that we have seen in the current pandemic. This demand has not change at all very much. It is all the discretionary spending that sees a very significant decline. So that's something you have to bear in mind that the, the pattern of consumption is impacted negatively differently uh, during, a, during a recession. And of course, we have here a pandemic induced a recession and you have these different impacts. So depending upon how uh, let's say an economy specializes in the manufacturing of some goods, you can have very, very different outcomes regarding this. And this is observed usually in terms of how you measure that. You first notice that in terms of the decline of, of future indexes. I'm going to show you some example a little bit later on. Um, of course, the impact uh, uh, immediately also impact production. You observe that in container volumes. And later on, you observe that in the global value of trade. All of this is going to unfold in the following months. Uh, we already in, uh, show some, in some cases very substantial decline in global container moves. That's something that's an indicator of, of, of this impact. And as the, the demand for of these goods and the, the international trade uh, ex, is expected to go down, again, we're not entirely sure about to what, what share. I hear all sorts of figures, maybe 20, 25% in 2020. We'll, we'll see. Um, we, we're going to start to uh, report these measures in, in the following months. It's going to become clear and apparent. Okay. So, so let's start up with the, um, an, an index, which is called the um, RWI, which is essentially the measure of container, uh, global container throughput. It uses a sample of ports, and each month they tally the, num uh, the volumes and they put an index and based upon a reference year. And as you can see, um, as of April 2020, you were observing some form of a trend in decline. It's not that steep so far, as you can see, causing this index is not as bad as we were observing uh, as if you pay attention, let's say, to May, uh, up to, let's say, uh, uh, May, May 2008, all the way up to, let's say, January 2010, you see the impact of the financial crisis. We'll see to what extent the current pandemic is an event which is uh, at a scale which is similar to this, um, uh, to this financial crisis. We'll see if it's going to be more enduring or not, it remains to be seen. But my assumption is going to be a, an event which will be having a similar scale of impact, possibly. It may be a little bit more enduring 
uh, we're going to find out. Um, this is an example of the traffic observed by the, the container traffic uh, noticed by the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, I use the Port of Los Angeles on a regular basis because I, for, as far as North America is concerned, it's the canary in the coal mine uh, because it's linked with the international trade, especially a trans-Pacific trade with China, the major providers of, uh, of goods, of retail goods, uh, which are consumed in North America. Uh, all of the, a lot of it passed through the Port of LA. So what happens in the Port of LA is a direct reflection of what's happening uh, within the American economy. And you can see here uh, during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, you see a substantial decline. And now as far as uh, 2020 is concerned, it's very clear that the Port of LA has experienced a sub -sub substantial decline as of May, as of last month, essentially 30% decline from previous uh, uh, from the previous year so that's um, I would say very substantial it does not look good regarding this although the previous month you saw we we saw that you can see on this chart a slight rebound that was probably uh, uh, delayed orders people were restocking and it looks like now you're gonna see the ongoing trend maybe it's gonna be again a replicate of what happened in 2008 2000 uh, 2009 and maybe over the next I would say six months to one year or so we're gonna see an ongoing decline uh, that, that trend is gonna it's gonna endure so that's a little bit another indicator uh, when we look at another indicator I like to look is the price of oil the price of energy and it's again very clear as of 2020 May, you see a, a, a very substantial decline. And that's, that's paradoxical. As we know, oil is a very substantial input in, in economic activity. So if the price of oil is very low, it, it should augur well, that is, oh, the global economy should be having some kind of a, of a subsidy of low energy prices, which allow to reduce the operating costs of a, of a lot of, a, of operators, airlines, shipping companies, also manufacturer activities, which are energy dependent, all the way down to the consumer driving their car. But of, of course, when the price of energy declines, is also a strong indication that the demand has vanished. And that's what the price of oil is reflecting, is that disappearance of, of, the, of a substantial demand, which has met one of the largest decline in oil prices in, in, in more than in a decade or so, to levels around $20, $25 a barrel. Again, it depends which month you're using it as a frame of reference. It's, it's something which is, of course, highly reflective of, 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 of an ongoing recession, if not uh, depression. So let's have now a look of how the global economy could unfold in a post-pandemic uh, setting. Um, it is, I must, I must say, very easy to be uh, negative regarding this. We're going to find out, I hear all sort of uh, uh, points of view, we're going to get a V-shaped recession, which is possible. Some say a U-shape, also possible. And I might say maybe we're going to get a, a W-shape, that is, we're going to get uh, with the, the, the first setback that we experience, maybe a, 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 a counter period of growth because of the economy coming back online and some kind of open expectation and then a wave of deflation and default uh, because the economy does not come as significant as it was before and then a second wave in this uh, massive, uh, I would say, deflationary process. So let's a little bit speculate about this. And I called it... Uh, the, the great reset. It's across the board, across pretty much every single economy in the world. And that's what is, uh, I would say, quite impressive regarding this COVID pandemic. It is how substantial and all encompassing it is. So here's a little bit of my take uh, on this. Uh, those are six elements. I think the, the, the great, what I call the great reset, uh, reset would involve. First of all, we can think about a workforce. Um, what's going to happen, in my opinion, outside a lot of uh, high level of unemployment, that's for sure, is that corporations that come back, that restart their operation, that restart their manufacturing, if they're a manufacturer, they start their retail operation, whatsoever operation they are involved in, they're going to have very serious questioning about what is my, the, the actual level of labor that I need they're gonna call back up their most productive workers first. And from there on, they're gonna decide every probably month, every week or so, how much more workers that I bring back. And my concern is they're gonna realize because the demand is a little bit lower, or they might realize because of structural changes such as automation, which is also a very big 
uh, risk linked with this, that they may need much less labor than before. That's a very, very big risk concerning the Great Reset. Also, the fact that we realize that a lot of work could be done remotely, much more than we expected. They might, many corporations might realize, oh, instead of having, a, per, uh, uh, let's say, permanent employees working in my office, I might have more uh, freelance people working from home and you, uh, using form of teleworking. And again, that's going to be linked with a very big uh, rationalization of, of the workforce. So that's one element. The second element, I think, which is going to be quite significant is we have realized in this that the service sector which most advanced economies depend massively on, is excessively vulnerable because a lot of it is discretionary demand. So I'm going to give you some data later on. Is the service economies in, in Europe, North America in particular, are excessively vulnerable to this reset because you can get rid of a lot of economic activity when you talk about services without having any impact whatsoever on the production capabilities of an economy. So that's something which the, uh, the pandemic has underlined. Uh, the third factor is to what extent we're going to get more discretionary demand in the future, uh, it, which is linked to the previous issue. That is the retail, the travel, and the restoration industry, which are very big pillars of, of, an, of an advanced economy, uh, have been shown to be the most vulnerable. In many cases, of course, the travel industry, the demand for air travel has pretty much vanished in the last few months. And airlines have been forced to demand, of course, some form of support because if you lose an airline network, it is something which is very difficult to reconstruct afterwards. So again, what's going to be the future of, of, this, of the discretionary demand? And to what extent it's going to be there? And that's going to take a while to come back because uh, people are going to say, hey, I'm going to focus on essential issues and we might see less travel. Or maybe we're going to see something different. That is, people are, are eager to go back to enjoy themselves, go back to rest, uh, to travel after, let's say, the lockdowns are, are levy and people want to go back. But again, I don't think they're going to be traveling internationally. They might go domestically. So it's going to be excessively complicated what will be the impact on the future demand. And it's going to have a very significant, I would say, uh, deflationary effect on the global economy and international trade. The four point here are what we, I call cascading defaults. Um, if you think about this, if somebody stopped to pay their rent in a large retail complex, such as, of course, um, um, such as um, a shopping mall. If you have, let's say, 20% of the renters that stop paying their rent, the holding companies start also to default on their debt, which start, to, which start a cascading default. And we start to have a lot of those taking place at the same time everywhere. Uh, people remember the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 was triggered by this, by a cascading default, which were linked with real estate in particular, which have very significant impact on other economy because of all these interrelations. Somebody owes somebody's money and can only pay somebody back if somebody else pays them back and, it, and so on and so forth. So if somebody stops paying, you get a default, you get a cascade. And at this point, that's my very big concern is you get in every sector of the economic activity you can think of uh, from a, a, a real estate, manufacturing, all the debt that people hold, credit card, car lease, Think about it. anything you can think of is subject to those cascading default and risk. And if they start to take place, you know, it's very difficult to stop. So that's the fourth, uh, uh, I would say, element of the Great Reset. The fifth one is a little bit more specific. It seems to be that small size activities, businesses, are tend to be the, more, the most vulnerable. And that's not entirely, I would say, demonstrated at this point in time because it's paradoxical. The, the small are maybe the most vulnerable because they have the less cash flow, they have the less cash reserve. At, at the same time, also, this offers opportunities for small, nimble companies to come in and develop post-COVID business models, which are, facing, which are, I would say, adapting to a new demand pattern, a new, let's say, consumer behavior or new forms of, I would say, ma manufacturing and production, which did not exist before, and, and maybe the big corporations might be less able to do so. So 
it's an it's an interesting question I ask myself. To what extent is going to be a size effect in this reset? Last and not least, and that one is I would say very interesting in itself, is all the potential substitution effect that could take place. Uh, we saw that with e-commerce. Uh, the pandemic accelerated the demand for uh, online shopping, uh, all the way down to grocery deliveries as well. That was very, very impressive. Um, it makes me wonder to what extent our economy would have been able to function effectively uh, 10 years ago with, without, let's say, e-commerce. A lot of people depended on this to have essential goods being delivered. And the e-commerce company have been quite sub uh, successful at being able to handle that dramatic stress. Wherever I look out in Europe, North America, and, and, and of course in, in Korea, Japan, and China, uh, a lot of uh, e-commerce companies were able to uh, more or less successfully, but actually they, they were able to handle this very dramatic, I would say, change, substitution in the demand. And that's paradoxically, and is the risk behind this, is that process of substitution would push further for automation, uh, in my opinion, without a doubt. Uh, the people are going to say, okay, we need um, more uh, robots because uh, robots obviously are less prone to catch diseases, of course, or transmit disease. We might see that in retail, restoration. That's going to be all encompassing. And that was a trend that has already began uh, several years ago, but the pandemic has been forcing a much faster substitution effect than we thought of. So those are the six major elements of what I call that uh, great reset. So again, this slide underlines what I think about this. What are the expectation of substitution which the e-commerce industry um, could um, can handle? Because during the pandemic, uh, the, the supply chain were well established uh, and they were no longer, I would say, marginal activity. They were becoming mainstream and the pandemic has allowed e-commerce now to become mainstream. And what is also interesting, it's going to have an impact on grocery deliveries as well. We're going to see a lot of new startups, a lot of retailers uh, are now shifting massively to these, uh, this new form of, uh, obviously, of uh, servicing the retail. And that's going to be linked with a de decline in their footprint, necessary footprint. That's what e-commerce was all about. E-commerce was a decline of the real estate footprint which has an impact on the valuation of many portfolios. It can have an impact even on density of central business districts. Uh, regarding this. So that's something which is also subject to a lot of speculation about how global cities are going to be able to function effectively in a post-COVID pandemic. And this map simply gives you an idea of, in the United States, the footprint of Amazon. This is simply one element of its footprint, that is the e-fulfillment center. And during the pandemic, uh, I think for what I could uh, was announced that Amazon was hiring about close to 100,000 workers. I'm not sure if these figures have been revised or not, but it does, that's a very substantial, I would say, shift. And in a post-COVID setting, wherever you look at, if you're in Europe, North America, wherever you look at, I would expect the footprint of e-commerce in terms of warehousing, distribution centers, uh, sortation centers, all the facilities that are linked with e-commerce are going to see, I would say, a notable increase in their footprint, which is going to be mitigated by to what extent discretionary demand is going to decline. So we want to see to what extent we're going to have a balancing hack. But as far as retail is concerned, the conventional brick and mortar retail chain are going to be the ones suffering the most, uh, in my opinion, while e-commerce is going to be the least impacted and could be actually see a positive outcome out of this. So to show you again the vulnerability of our service-oriented economies uh, to the pandemic, and uh, it, it, that this chart is very illustrative. It shows uh, jobless claims in the United States uh, for the month of April from a sample of states. And you can clearly see here on the list of the most vulnerable sectors, starting with uh, accommodation, hotels, uh, food services, retail, healthcare services, which is very paradoxical because people say, oh, in the pandemic, you saw the demand for healthcare services. Yes, but it's very special. It's emergency healthcare services, which is a very small niche overall, while all the elective surgeries, all the, the standard medical practices has essentially vanished during the pandemic. So all of this, you see here a long list of different sectors, and a lot of them are service oriented. And people are wondering to what extent this, this is going to come back. So that's again, underlying the vulnerability of service oriented economies. And this is probably uh, the same observation going to be uh, taking place all over the world. Um, and that's also, you have to cross-reference this with the probability of automation. 
And again, the, uh, the activities that are the most prone to automation, think about this here, office administrative support, food processing, um, cultural work, sales, all of these activities are highly prone uh, towards automation. So that's, uh, I would say, a very interesting type of risk and how automation is going to play itself out in a post-pandemic setting. It's going to also have an impact on manufacturing, that's for sure, as well, and transportation and logistics. We're going to see, and that's something I'm very big concern, is automation was already having a very negative impact on employment. But now you put COVID plus automation, you get a very, you could say from an employment perspective, a very negative context, which could exacerbate the issue. Um, and again, this one is showing you uh, international air travel, the risk. Those are the arrivals. And this discretionary domain industry has not vanished, but 2020 is going to be a very, very bad year. And if you want to have a list of the countries that's going to be the most deeply impacted by this, or it is, uh, number one, France, uh, Spain, United States, and then China, which have, we were receiving massive amount of visitors. This is arrivals. It does not show uh, who, where's the, what's the origin. Uh, but think about uh, how vulnerable the French and the Spanish economy are going to be in the post-pandemic setting. It's going to take a while for this industry, I would say, uh, to come back. Which brings us uh, to our conclusion. And that's, uh, I would say, uh, an interesting question. Uh, to what extent we may have reached a peak globalization? Is it a, a fact or this is something which is just speculative and we might return back to normal maybe in a year or so? But that's something which is certainly worth considering. Uh, because before the pandemic took place, there were already many factors, uh, such as obviously offshoring, outsourcing, those processes were receding, you were having reshoring uh, taking place. Uh, you already have a problem with trade deals uh, in terms of renegotiation, uh, the unwillingness of uh, advanced economies, particularly the United States, obviously, which is a salient example of uh, uh, letting, the, the, let's say, the current context endure because it was perceiving to have negative economic impact on, on, its, uh, on its economy. So all of this event is gonna create a re-question of all of this. And we might see, I would say, a rebalancing of, of, of the global economy of international trade. And that's my take. Moving from a pre-COVID setting, where you had four major processes was driving that integration process, you know, negotiation, trade agreements, uh, harmonization of, of, of regimes, harmonization of uh, cons custom inspections, uh, for instance. All of this were very positive in making trade big, smoother, and faster. Same thing with production. Offshoring was the rule of the game. Uh, global supply chain, international transportation, the same. Ports were growing very rapidly. Uh, containerization, maritime shipping companies, air freight. All of this was obviously following this trend, although the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 was... Uh, I would say a setback, but still, it's going to be very, very difficult for international transportation uh, to see growth in the coming years. And the, the third factor was, again, uh, all the transactional environment, you know, information technology, the capital available to invest. I wonder what's going to happen with foreign direct investments in a post-COVID setting. Even though commodity prices are going to be lower, which means going to be less money or less, less capital needed to invest in additional production, capability for resources, also manufacturing, all of this is going to play itself out to, cre to create maybe an environment which is going to, cre uh, which is going to result in a, 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 let's say, a relatively temporary setback for globalization. It may have went, you could say, too far a little bit. Again, that's a perspective from North America, you would say. And we'll see, because that's very clear, a very big uh, loser, if I can use that term, uh, potential loser for this will be China, uh, for, for many fronts. First of all, the lack of trust. People are realizing that China was not behaving very honestly, uh, especially in publishing the data about the, the effect of a pandemic. Uh, in some ways, denying it was taking place. And this may have resulted in a wide, widespread, uh, 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 I would say, a growth of the, of the diffusion, especially during the stealth phase. So there's going to be a reckoning regarding this. So we're, we're going to see in the coming months, uh, China's going to have a big PR problem. And countries in, in Europe and North America, uh, maybe also in Asia, they're going to be very skeptical 
about this and they might revise their investment strategy within China. So that's an aspect. Maybe we're also going to lose trust in international institutions as well, right? Because of, uh, of what, what's, what happened. Uh, and that the outcome of this will be a, a bit more protectionism. That's something which uh, is, of course, of concern. Um, again, I was talking about automation. And it's going to tr probably trigger a form of reshoring of, of manufacturing based upon vulnerability. How vulnerable are essential? I think the United States during the pandemic realized to its shock and horror how dependent it was on China, particularly for essential pharmaceutical products, even all the way down to protective equipment, such as uh, masks, devices, gloves, all of this. Uh, it's going to be, uh, there are probably going to be rules, laws, and regulations. They're going to force uh, providers of this to say, okay, you cannot supply the United States with these type of goods uh, if it sources internationally. You, it has to be produced, so a share of it, domestically from now on. And I suspect it's going to impact many types of supply chain, particularly if it's non-discretionary. You say, if it's essential, we need a share of that manufacturing of that distribution to take place nationally because of strategic interest. We don't want to be caught, let's say, figuratively with our pens down in the future regarding this. So that's something that's going to be interesting to observe uh, regarding globalization and international trade in the months and years to come. To what extent national policy is going to implement, influence the structure of manufacturing and based upon a scale of vulnerability. When it's discretion, we don't care. You can, you can upsource offshore whatever you want. It's not something which is just essential, so we're not considered too much vulnerable about this. But if it's something, a good or service, even a service that we judge to be essential, sorry, you're going to have to have a rule of origin. So that's a, a very, very big risk. So ex expect that to, to come in the following months or years. Um, and with this said, that's going to be uh, the end of my presentation. Again, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, glad I've been able to give you this, I would say, personal uh, perspective from, a, from an academic that have been observing international trade, uh, containerization, international transportation for now more than approximately three decades or so. And if you want to have more information about all of this, I would uh, recommend to, for you to have a look at my uh, website, my textbook, which is available at the link which is uh, provided here. So. Uh, Again, thank you very much for your attention and hopefully have a nice day.